Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we focus on day-to-day -day clinical issues in gastroenterology. I'm Elaine Robertson, a gastroenterology trainee in the west of Scotland. Today we're discussing bariatric surgery in the management of obesity. And I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Simon Gibson. Mr. Gibson is a consultant upper GI surgeon at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow with a special interest in bariatric surgery. Welcome, Mr. Gibson, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Hi, thank you very much. Now, we can't talk about obesity without mentioning the scale of the problem. How big a problem is it in Scotland and worldwide? Without being flippant, it's a, it's a huge problem. In 2015, 65% of the UK, of the Scottish population were overweight and 29% were categorised as being obese. Uh, Scotland is actually fairly representative of the rest of the UK and the UK is the 27th most obese country in the world. Uh, it is behind Australia, Canada and quite a fair bit behind America where around 40% can be classified as obese. I think the most worrying thing is that there's been an increase in around 10% in those in the UK categorised as obese over the last 10 years. And I think this will pose major health problems in the future, as we'll discuss later. Now, whatever specialty you work in, you will see the health consequences of obesity. What are the consequences and what are the implications for a publicly funded health service? I think you're absolutely right. Certainly as a surgeon, obesity tends to make operations more difficult. But I think from a, a physician point of view, almost every specialist uh, will, will have some issues. Type 2 diabetes is probably the one that first springs to mind. And it's estimated that 85% of cases of type 2 diabetes mellitus are related to obesity. Uh, and that's certainly one of the areas we tend to focus on from a surgical point of view. But as a gastroenterologist, uh, obviously we know about steatosis, uh, fatty liver disease and the, the worries about progression to hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, from a respiratory point of view, we've got obstructive sleep apnea and there's also increases in incidence of depression uh, as well as a multitude of cancers. Obviously, we've illustrated earlier that the, the problems with obesity are growing and in our publicly funded service, that's likely to cause increasing problems in the future and will put increasing strain on both primary and secondary care unless it can be addressed. What's the overall approach to the management of obesity? So I think obesity should be managed uh, using a staged approach. Um, first of all, we would start off with uh, health education, public health. Um, and I think that this should particularly focus on, on children um, as to some extent we may have missed a generation in, in able to educate about the, the problems of obesity. Following this, uh, there'll be good work done in primary care by general practitioners. And after that, I think we would be looking at the uh, lifestyle and dietetic support, uh, which would include specifically dietetics, but also some psychological support. Beyond that, uh, we would look at more interventional approaches such as endoscopic or, or surgical ones. So it's easy to say to people, go on a diet, exercise, lose weight. Does it work? I think it does work to an extent. Uh, certainly we work closely with uh, weight management in Glasgow and in other areas. And there are, are successes, but the successes aren't common. And even when we do have success, uh, isn't extreme weight loss normally, it's around 5 to 10 kilograms. Now that's useful as it's been shown that losing 5 kilograms can have a significant improvement in your health and it's also been estimated that every kilogram you lose decreases your chances of, uh, of getting diabetes mellitus type 2 by around 16%. So certainly these are strategies that, sh that should be used uh, but probably not in isolation. When should we involve a surgeon? I think that we obviously have to ration uh, the surgical side of things and, and that's why the dietetic side is, is very important. In the past we've tended to focus on weight loss alone but there's increasing evidence about the benefits of surgery particularly related to comorbidities and other illnesses such as diabetes and sleep apnea and I think really if we have people who would be fit to undergo surgery and who have specific comorbidities that we can help, these would be the type of patients we'd be most keen to see. 
Are there categories in terms of BMI or comorbidities that would qualify people for weight loss surgery? So the, the NICE guidelines would suggest that people with a BMI of 35 and above with comorbidities or 40 and above without comorbidities would be suitable for surgery. There was a national planning forum conducted in Scotland uh, around 10 years ago and this set out three specific priority groups and the first two of these priority groups were patients with type 2 diabetes and thereafter other comorbidities began to enter such as fatty liver disease or sleep apnea. What are the commonly performed procedures? The most commonly performed procedures in the UK at the present time would be gastric band, sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass. Around 10 years ago, the gastric band was by far the most commonly uh, conducted operation. But over time, we've seen some issues with this and that's meant that the bypass and now sleeve gastrectomy are now conducted more commonly. Now, remember that I'm not a surgeon. What do these procedures involve? Sure. So starting with the, the most simple one, that's the gastric band. Uh, using keyhole or laparoscopic surgery, we would uh, go in and we'd place a, a, a band around the, the top of the stomach. Now, it's been thought in the past that that band should be inflated to a level in which the, the gullet or, or upper stomach is constricted to prevent you eating. But actually, that leads to functional problems in the future. And what we'd really aim for would be to create a small pouch of stomach above the band. And when food passed down that, that would send a vagal stimulus to the brain, making us feel full and leading to satiety. And that's one of the reasons that the gastric band is really a tool towards weight loss rather than a guarantee, because it very much depends on patient's behaviour, eating the correct things and having correct eating habits. OK, the gastric bypass? So gastric bypass would currently be seen to be the, the gold standard operation um, from a bariatric point of view, although it has now been taken over by the sleeve gastrectomies that are performed most commonly worldwide. And that uh, has two components to it. The first is a restrictive component where a small pouch of stomach is created using a stapler laparoscopically. And this would reduce the amount that we can eat in a similar way to the gastric band. But the second more important component is the bypass of at least 100 centimetres of small bowel, meaning that the uh, food ingested and the uh, pancreatic bowel reduces don't meet till further down the line and this leads to uh, weight loss um, and also significant hormonal changes. Okay, and that brings us to the sleeve gastrectomy? Yeah, so the sleeve gastrectomy uh, is conducted, basically you remove 80% of the stomach and you turn the stomach from being a, a bag, as, as we all know, into a straight tube. That means that uh, it reduces the amount we can eat, patients feel full quicker. But uh, the hormone uh, ghrelin is produced predominantly in the fundus of the stomach and that's the most common uh, hormone to give you an appetite. So by doing the sleeve gastrectomy, we reduce appetite and thus help reduce weight. And how do they compare in terms of success and complications? So really going from the, the gastric band to sleeve gastrectomy to bypass, we increase the complexity of the surgery but in return, we get more benefits in terms of weight loss and comorbidity resolution. And really it should be weight loss and comorbidity resolution that we use to judge. So you would say the gastric band would, would lose as 40% of our excess weight on average. The sleeve gastrectomy would be 60 to 70% of excess weight and the bypass would be around 70 to 80% of excess weight. And excess weight basically means the, the amount of weight above our ideal, of B, I, I, our ideal BMI of 25, which we lose. From a comorbidity point of view, it's diabetes that's been studied the most and the bypass is best at that. Uh, around 70 to 80 percent of patients will be in remission from their diabetes, depending on what standards are used. The sleeve gastrectomy is also very good from that point of view, around 70 percent of people would go into remission from their diabetes and with the gastric band it would probably be less than 50% and with gastric banding the, the effect on diabetes is really more associated with weight loss whereas with other two operations the, the benefits come separate from the weight loss and are again due to hormonal manipulation. What about other comorbidities? Uh, so the other common comorbidities that we'd see improvement in would be sleep apnea and a lot of patients would be able to come off their sleep apnea masks following surgery. 
and from the point of view of a gastroenterologist then we would see improvement in the fatty steatosis and really all grades of liver disease related to uh, obesity would improve with surgery. So how do you weigh up these obvious benefits against the complications? I think that initially we're, we're referred to probably the most extreme and the most unfit patients and whilst they would have the most to gain they would also have the most to lose. With current methods, uh, good anaesthetics and, and conducting surgery lapar laparoscopically, the, there's a low mortality with, with all of the procedures, um, which would be around one in a thousand for a gastric banding, two or three in a thousand for sleeve gastrectomy and bypass. Um, but that's obviously the most extreme complication. One of the reasons the gastric band's fallen out of favour is, is, is other complications in the longer term. Having a, a tight ring around your lower esophagus leads to functional problems and a lot of patients will represent with reflux, regurgitation, vomiting, meaning they'll need to have the bands removed. And there can be more serious complications from the banding, including a slippage, which is actually a prolapse of the proximal stomach above the band or erosion where the band pushes into the stomach. And these would be complications that a gastroenterologist might well be sent and have to deal with emergently. From the point of view of the, the sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric bypass, their complications are very much perioperative. And with the sleeve gastrectomy, we have a very large staple line. And there's obviously risks that that will fail to heal and lead to leakage and septus, or there can be bleeding both outside the stomach into the peritoneal cavity, but also inside with a, with a GI bleed. From a gastric bypass point of view, there's a number of staple lines and anastomoses, and this can lead to failure to heal uh, anastomotic leaks and sepsis. And one of the major problems with the gastric bypass in the future uh, is that when people lose weight, they can often develop internal hernias from the manipulation of the small bowel and the creation of, of new spaces within the abdomen. How do you advise your patients? How do you weigh it all up? I think that we're very lucky in that the patients we see tend to have been quite well prepped, they haven't been referred from weight management services, but I would always say that surgery should be a last resort and that other methods should certainly have been exhausted. Uh, certainly whilst we don't see the, the significant weight loss with the diet and exercise, these would be much safer and more organic ways to lose weight. As I say, most of the patients we see have, have tried these things and have been in programmes several times, often for years on end. And in those patients, they, they, they're often very set on surgery. And we just have to be honest with them, uh, explain the complications, and also explain that the operations aren't a guarantee of weight loss and that really they only work along with altered behaviour. And that's why we need continued support, both psychologically and dietetically, following surgery. What about dumping syndrome? Do you see that very often? Absolutely, and, and whilst dumping syndrome previously would be seen as a bad thing, we, we see it as a good thing because it's, uh, it's a way of educating patients uh, and, mm -hmm. and really it's only patients that aren't abiding by the, the rules that they've been set pre-surgery by dietitians that would experience this. It's uh, quite a common phenomenon following bypass and that's why bypass would often be the, the go-to procedure for people who predominantly eat sweets, but <laughs> in some patients we, we also uh, see dumping after sleeve gastrectomy because there is certainly increased gastric emptying following sleeve and, and, and that's one of the reasons that operation would also work. So how do you manage these symptoms with patients? So management is almost entirely dietetic. Uh, patients eating uh, smaller volumes, less carbohydrate, uh, more frequent, uh, less heavy meals. What about nutritional complications? So nutritional workup is really important. Uh, patients are educated about that before they, they come for surgery. And particularly following uh, the procedures we conduct more of these days, such as bypass and sleeve gastrectomy, it's very important uh, for both the uh, supplementation um, and assessment after surgery. All patients would be on a complete uh, replacement multivitamin uh, from two weeks post-surgery. And if that's adhered to, that should uh, prevent any complications or nutritional issues in the future. However, not all patients, as you can imagine, would, would adhere to that. Um, so it's therefore important for us to, to measure um, these vitamins and, and things like that post-surgery. And we would generally do that at three months, six months, one year and two years. After that, patients will normally be discharged from secondary care. And from then on, we would do a handover to general practitioners uh, regarding what needs to be done. 
probably the most common issues we see are with the different types of anemia and patients would need vitamin B12 injections every four months. It's, it's very poorly absorbed orally. Uh, secondly, we would often see issues with the uh, folate as well and that, that should be covered and, and replaced. Issues with the uh, trace elements in, in urea and electrolytes, things like that are, are less common. They would only tend to occur if there's some complication of the surgery, but that's also something we would certainly need to keep an eye on. There's a really useful resource on the, the BOMS website, uh, which is the Society for Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery in the UK. There's, there's a paper on nutritional guidance, and, and I'll commonly send that a link to that to any GPs or, or other interested parties who will have shared care of our patients. Are there any less invasive options? There are less invasive options, uh, and these are increasing at the present time. The bottom line though is that I don't think any are really at the stage where they should be used commonly. Um, but I think the, the, there's interesting platforms that will provide a pro possibly good options in the future. The one endoscopic option which is commonly conducted is the, the gastric balloon and that basically involves endoscopy under sedation or, or even without with throat spray sometimes and a placement of a plastic a silicone balloon inside the stomach and that's inflated with about 500 ml of, of fluid and that basically acts as a space occupying device and reduces the amount people can eat. Unfortunately, it is associated with quite bad functional symptoms, nausea, vomiting, reflux and patients are generally miserable for the first five days afterwards. If they can get through that period of time, then the balloon does have some efficacy with weight loss, but it is a temporary measure and has to be removed after six months. It's been shown that patients will lose 85%, will, will regain 85% of the weight that they've lost after the balloon's been removed, and therefore I would now only recommend the balloon as a staged procedure to definitive bariatric surgery or in patients that need surgery for another reason. Uh, for example, if they've got a, an early cancer or need an orthopaedic surgery, because really I don't think it should be used as a standalone procedure. The, other than that, there's a lot of interesting intra-gastric suturing platforms and devices being developed. However, these are at an early stage. The results of them haven't really been validated, but that will certainly be something that we should look out for in the future. So what do you think are the important components of preoperative counselling? So dietary, uh, people need to understand the changes that they'll have to make because the good bariatric surgical procedures will mean people's attitude to food, their approach to food, the, what they'll be able to take from portion point of view will be changed for life and it's important that they use their smaller portions wisely, eat the correct things. Uh, take time between eating, uh, avoid drinking a lot of fluid while they eat and basically uh, avoid other things like overeating which would lead to something like uh, dumping syndrome. Psychological support is often very important as well. I, I don't think it's something that everyone should have or, or be required to have but a lot of people who come and see uh, have underlying depression and whether it's the depression that's led to them being overweight or whether they, they, they're depressed because they are overweight, I, I don't think really matters. And we often have patients with disordered eating, uh, emotional eating in, in particular, something that it's important to have coping strategies for because surgery are, is a stress and, and if patients overeat in stressful times and don't learn how to deal with that, then there's more risk of complications after operations. So all that's left really is for me to thank you for a fantastic update on the surgical management of obesity. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for Digest This.